Welcome to UCLA Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. My name is Isaac Yang, and I'm a neurosurgeon here who specializes in acoustic neuromas. I'm really happy to bring you this webinar, and I'm glad to be able to reach a lot of people through the convenience of the internet and the technologies we have here at UCLA. I hope to discuss some cutting edge, high tech treatments, and the latest advances in our treatments for acoustic neuromas and the services we offer here at UCLA. Hopefully you find this useful, and if you have any questions, we have a staff and a team here ready to answer questions. So please log on through Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus and come in and ask, ask your questions. We'll be happy to answer them in the second half of this hour. So we're going to talk about acoustic neuromas and about how treatments are getting better and about how we are using the latest technologies and the latest treatments to make acoustic neuroma therapy the best we can. First, for my disclosure of independence, I have no financial support or relationship with any company related to this presentation, and I have some research support that supports our research. Vestibular schwannomas, otherwise known as acoustic neuromas. These are two of the same tumors, different names for the exact same kind of tumor. And they are intracranial extraaxial tumors. That means they happen inside the head, but they happen just outside the brain, just outside of the brain stem. And these occur in this, what's called the CP angle, the cerebellar pontine angle. That sounds complicated, but it's just describing this location. And the most common tumor in the cerebellar pontine angle are acoustic neuromas or vestibular schwannomas. And these, again, complicated names, hard to pronounce, but the exact same tumor, just two different names followed by meningiomas and epidermoids, which are also tumors that uh, occur in this area. But today, we're going to focus on acoustic neuromas that occur in the CP angle. And the first thing that we're going to talk about for acoustic neuromas is observation. There are three major treatment options for acoustic neuromas, observation, radiation, and neurosurgery. And I know I'm a surgeon, but the first thing is I want to do what's best for my patients. And the first option that you have available for acoustic neuroma is observation, especially if the tumor is small. Now, sometimes small things can lead to big problems, but acoustic neuromas, they're commonly small, slow-growing, benign tumors. And if they're sm small and slow-growing, observation is absolutely something to consider. And this is a paper uh, that we published looking at observation of untreated uh, vestibular schwannomas. And we found that when you watch these tumors, what was really important was the growth rate. It wasn't so much the size of the acoustic neuroma, it was how fast was the tumor growing. Things that are bad grow fast. And so fast growing acoustic neuromas, these cause problems. Slow growing acoustic neuromas, these might be ones that you may want to observe. So that we found that growth, fact, growth factor was the key prognostic factor in hearing preservation. Now when we look at acoustic neuromas, this is a tumor that occurs near the seventh nerve, the facial nerve for smiling, near the hearing nerve, and near the nerve for balance. And so those are the things that are most at risk with acoustic neuromas, hearing, balance, and facial nerve, your ability to smile. I always tell my patients I want to see them waking up smiling because that means their facial nerve is still intact. So we want to preserve facial nerve function, we want to preserve hearing, and we want to preserve balance if possible. And we found that when you watch these acoustic neuromas in patients who were not getting treated with either radiation or surgery and just observation, that the real important indicator was, was growth rate and growth rate over time. And that specific number was actually two and a half millimeters. We found that tumors that were growing two and a half millimeters or more per year were more likely to cause problems. And so if I see a patient who is young, who has a small acoustic neuroma, but if that tumor is growing more than two and a half millimeters per year, even if that patient has no problems today, I'm more likely to recommend intervention because at some point, that's going to cause a problem. And that's what the evidence shows. What's really cool about acoustic neuromas and the, the developments we have is that we're developing minimally invasive, maximally effective therapies that require no surgery. And we call this radio surgery or stereotactic radiotherapy. There's no incision. There's no anesthesia no local, there's, it's, it's essentially almost pain-free. And this is a newer development that's been developed over the past 20 or 30 years. And we call this either stereotactic radiotherapy or stereotactic radiosurgery. And this has essentially revolutionized acoustic neuromatherapy because we found that acoustic neuromas respond well to radiosurgery. It's minimally invasive, maximally effective. Now there are some things to delineate about this is that 
here at UCLA, I do both open neurosurgery and radiosurgery or radiotherapy for acoustic neuromas. I do both. And I think that's a really key distinction that you want to look for in your practitioners because if they only do open neurosurgery, they're going to want to treat every tumor with the open neurosurgery. If they only do the radiotherapy, they're going to want to treat every acoustic neuroma with the radiotherapy. Since I do both, I feel that we can give you the option here at UCLA to do both treatments, and it doesn't matter which treatment line you go down, we can offer you both in the same person, and that's me. And I think that's a really key distinction that we can do in my consultations with patients, because we can discuss all the options, and I can give you my honest opinion without any sort of disincentive or incentive in any particular way. But radiosurgery is a really new development in the past 20 or 30 years that has been shown to be very effective in controlling tumor growth. So that if you have a small acoustic neuroma and it's not causing you any problems, radiosurgery has been shown in almost 80 to 90% of these cases not to let these tumors grow and not to cause any other problems. That's a fairly good uh, odds, and if I gave you those kinds of odds, it's something that you'd have to seriously consider. And so if you want to look at acoustic neuromas, the first option is, well, this wasn't causing me any problems. I'm going to watch it. And the small ones, you can. Well, this one's small. It's not causing any problems, but I want to do something. Well, then radiation is an option to look at for these uh, tumors. Radiosurgery is most effective for tumors that are less than 2.5 centimeters in size. So once they get too big, radiation is less effective and it's less of an option. And so radiosurgery is a very uh, interesting uh, option that we can do for um, acoustic aromas. And what we did, we did a study to look at acoustic aromas to say, what was the rate of hearing preservation? How well can we save your hearing with radiation or radiosurgery? There are a few papers, there's a few papers in the literature that we looked at that said this one showed that hearing preservation was uh, 90%, upwards of 90%. And the next paper showed that hearing preservation was about 50%. And so there was a wide disparity in the literature. And so what we did was a systematic analysis to look at all of these data have to come together and, and talk about one point. And what is that overall aggregate number? And we did this in order to limit the institutional bias and preservations. And this was a paper that we published that I was the first author on. And this was done uh, around the time when the three organizations, CNS, AANS, and ASTRO, defined radiosurgery as those applications of stereotactic radiation in five fractions or less. And so that was the definition that we used. And in this very large systematic analysis, we found that if in the radio surgery, the treatment dose was 12.5 gray or less, hearing was preserved. So you had a higher rate of hearing preservation if the dose, radiation dose, was lower. This was very important to, to look at. We also found that the overall hearing preservation was approximately 50 to 60% based on these radiosurgery therapies. So this was based, based on both uh, linear accelerator radiosurgery as well as gamma knife radiosurgery, all forms of focused radiosurgery. That hearing preservation was about 50 to 60 percent in patients who had hearing preserved in advance. Then we looked at a more specific analysis for hearing preservation, and we looked at just gamma knife. And looking at just gamma knife, we found that the overall hearing preservation was about 51 percent. And this is separated from the linear accelerator technologies. And so these were more uh, in, in, in a reduced number of fractions. One of the really interesting areas of research that we're doing right now is looking at the overall number of fractions and seeing if changing the number of fractions might be better for hearing preservation. We just presented this at the Congress of Neurological Society uh, Surgeons Meeting uh, this past October as a Cynthia Skull Base Award winning uh, abstract. And it's in manuscript, uh, in press right now, which will be coming out on, in clinical neurosurgery, which shows that if you change the number of fractions, we might be able to do better in hearing preservation. So this is a really interesting area of research that's coming, coming on board right now. We wanted to look at something else, which was facial nerve function. Next to hearing is the facial nerve, the ability to move your face and to smile. And we found that radio surgery is very safe for facial nerve preservation. We found that it preserved... Uh, facial nerve preservation in upwards of 90 to 95 percent of patients who got treated with radiation. These are fantastic odds. If I gave you these 90 to 95 percent chance of winning X, you would take those odds uh, almost any day of the week. These are fantastic odds in terms of facial nerve preservation and treating acoustic neuromas with radiosurgery. And so here we found that overall facial preservation in this analysis, which we published, 
was around 96%, which is fantastic. And so radi radiation and radiosurgery has an outstanding rate of preserving facial nerve and a good rate of preserving hearing. It's not as good in hearing as it is for facial nerve, but it's still a, a very respectable number. It's still a very a good result if you consider the fact that it's minimally invasive and requires uh, no pain and no surgical, uh, no incision. There are other complications from radio surgery that you can, you can get. Uh, and the other cranial uh, neuropathies that you can get are trigeminal neuropathies and facial uh, palsies. So you can get pain in the face and facial pain. But these are pretty rare, occurring in only about 2 to 3% of these cases. And we found different rates of different symptoms being treated with these uh, uh, symptoms, either tinnitus or vertigo, tinnitus or ringing in the ear, or issues with balance. We're studying here at UCLA if different rates of radiation can affect the overall outcomes with either ringing in the ears or with balance. And so we want to look at the overall quality of life because when we look at patients, we don't just see tumors, we see patients. We pay see patients who are trying to live their lives, trying to keep their hearing, their facial nerve, their balance, and without ringing in their ears. And we're looking at patients overall and trying to maximize their quality of life. I know that this can be debilitating. My father uh, has really debilitating debil uh, tinnitus, and it bothers him in his quality of life every day. And so I know personally that these things can have a huge impact on quality of life. Overall, that we found in our analyses that less than 13 gray or 12.5 gray in radio surgery maximizes your chances of uh, preserving hearing, hearing preservation and also preserving facial nerve function. There are other things that we're looking in terms of research is looking at the fractionations. I mentioned that and how that's coming out in, in, to be published very shortly. There are other things to look at, things that cochlear dose, which is how much does the hearing apparatus receive in radiation, and also, also what are the vascularity patterns in these acoustic neuromas. These may be really future questions to look at now, and we're studying them right now at UCLA to maximize quality of life. On the downside, though, radio surgery doesn't always work. This is one of my very first publications looking at uh, a patient who came in and was treated with gamma knife radio surgery. You can see here that the patient's tumor started shrinking, and about two years after radio surgery, the tumor had shrinking down very, very much after radio surgery. What we did find, though, was after two and a half years, the tumor blew up. It expanded quite rapidly and required surgery. And so radio surgery doesn't always work for every acoustic neuroma. Then we have open microneurosurgery. And like I mentioned, I do both. I do both stereotactic radiation radiosurgery as well as open neurosurgery. And being able to do both puts me in a position where I can consult on which, which analysis is the best option. For acoustic neuromas that are in young patients, for acoustic neuromas that are larger, bigger than two and a half, three centimeters, these are tumors that are very amenable to surgery because radiosurgery or radiation will not be as, as good for this. The other thing to look at is with brainstem compression. If the tumor has a lot of brainstem compression or is fairly significant in size, these will not be the best ones for surgical intervention. Conversely, for patients who have acoustic neuromas who are a little bit older, elderly patients, or have significant comorbidities and wouldn't be able to undergo an open surgery, radiation may be the best option. And so for acoustic neuromas, I really do think every person is different. And that makes every acoustic neuroma different. It means every patient needs customized, personalized consultation and therapy in order to approach this tumor. And so each person is different. Each person's uh, therapy should be different. This is a, uh, a drawing, a uh, medical illustration of an acoustic neuroma. And you can see this is the tumor here, and this is the nerve for hearing. You see how, how it comes uh, to the nerve for hearing? This right here is the nerve for balance and this is the nerve for, for facial. So we have the nerve from balance for where the tumor is coming, and hence the term vestibular schwannoma. You have the facial nerve here, which is a nerve for facial function, and this here is a nerve for hearing. And so this tumor comes very, very close to these apparatuses, and so we need to try to do our best to preserve these things when we approach them with surgery. This was a, an analysis that we did to look at different kinds of surgeries. And when you do surgery for acoustic neuromas, there are three major approaches middle cranial fossa, retrosigmoid, and, and translab. And these are the uh, 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 acronyms that you see, MCF, RSA, and TL. And so translab, retrosig, and middle cranial fossa are the main ways to open neurosurgery for acoustic neuromas. 
and we found that TransLab had a higher rate of CSF leaks, but lower rates of cranial nerve complications. We also found that retrosigmoid approaches have a lower rate of CSF leak, but have a slightly higher rate of, of, of in, um, infection here in this analysis. And so looking at these patients that we looked at overall that had treatment for uh, microsurgical treatment of acoustic neuromas, we found a different rate of hearing preservation, about 70% in patients with less than 3 centimeter tumors, and about 44% in patients with greater than 3 centimeter tumors. If you have hearing intact and you want to save hearing, you want to try to approach it with a retrosigmoid approach. If you do a translab approach, we reserve those for patients whose hearing has been lost. Because if you do a translab approach in a patient who has hearing intact, their hearing will be gone. And so we do our absolute best to preserve hearing if possible. The other thing to recognize here is that when tumors are larger, the rate of preserving hearing and facial nerve function is harder. And so we want to try to treat these small tumors before they become big problems. And that's really the thing that revolutionized treatment with radiation radiosurgery is that radiation radiosurgery and radiotherapy have been shown to stop tumor growth in about 80 to 90 percent of treated tumors. And that's a fantastic odd. So if we find it small and we can keep it small, hopefully it'll lead to less problems later. Also, if we look at these tumors and we operate on them when they're smaller, that would may, perhaps may lead to better outcomes uh, with these tumors. Lastly, uh, I wanted to uh, mention this uh, most recent publication in the Journal of Neurosurgery. And this looked at, uh, this was a publication by Dr. Shrigru, which looked at extent of resection and how much tumor that needs to come out when you do the surgery. Uh, you know, when we did the uh, open microneurosurgery, uh, this was the only mainstay. Before radiosurgery and radiotherapy, this was the only way to treat acoustic neuromas. But now that we have a, a newer modality of radiation and radiotherapy that you can treat tumor after you've taken out most of it, they did analysis of, to look at, well, it doesn't matter whether you get 100% of the tumor out or if you want to try to save facial function and there's some tumor that's very a, 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 attached to the nerve and so you leave a little bit behind and you follow that or you treat that with radiation, did that make overall changes in their overall patient outcome? And this is the data from that paper. And essentially, these Kaplan-Meier curves show that whether or not they got 100% of the tumor out or they got most of the tumor out and followed the small residual with either observation or radiation, they found that the overall fractional rate of recurrence was essentially un unchanged in these two groups, which really puts out the question as to what's the goal of surgery? Is the goal of surgery to take the tumor out 100%? Or, or is the goal to maximize your patient's quality of life? And I think here at UCLA, in our Acoustic Normal program, with Dr. Neil Martin, myself, Dr. Ishiyama, Dr. Gopin, Dr. Selch, Dr. Kapralian, in our multidisciplinary group, our, our hope and our goal is absolutely quality of life first. Our patients come first. And so we will do whatever it takes to maximize your quality of life. That our patients with acoustic neuromas, whether it's radiation, observation or surgery and whether it's a maximal surgery or minimal surgery or some combination of the uh, of the three our goal is to maximize quality of life so looking at this i think this totally validates looking at patients and treating them with that personalized and customized approach to maximize patients quality of life this is a picture a uh, uh, paper that was published out of my lab by dr uh, fong and here uh, we uh, looked at this uh, acoustic neuromas is the tumors that we do take out and we do operations on. Uh, and this was uh, published by Dr. Gopin and myself as senior authors. Looking at this was once we take these tumors out, we want to study them. And in our laboratory, we are studying these acoustic neuromas to see if there's a better way that one day if there's some sort of injection or a shot or a pill or some magic wand that we can wave, we want to be the ones to find out and discover this so if we can do this and add to surgery, radiation, observation with some, some sort of molecular therapy, I'm hoping that in the future, in our lifetimes, by heart, uh, taking all these acoustic neuromas and putting them in our lab and banking them, we're going to be at the cutting edge of developing new molecular therapies for acoustic neuromas. Success is a team sport, and I'd like to thank everyone here at UCLA 
and here, here at the Ronald Reagan UCLA Neurosurgery Department. I'd like to thank my char chairman, Dr. Neil Martin, as well as everyone in the UCLA Brain Tumor Program, which is Linda Liao, uh, Rob Prince, Carol Cruz, Marvin Bergschneider, Bob Schaffer, and myself. And I'd like to thank everyone in the Acoustic Neuroma Program, uh, which is uh, myself, Dr. Martin, Dr. Ishiyama, Dr. Gopin, Dr. Selch, Dr. Kapralian. It's really a multidisciplinary approach. And I'd like to thank all the neuro-oncologists who are uh, listed here, Dr. Clousey, Dr. Nymphu, Dr. Lai. Uh, they say it takes a village to, to raise a child. I, I think it takes a, a small community, uh, which we have here at UCLA, to take care of acoustic neuromas, to take care of brain tumors, especially in the light of we want to do what's best to f maximize our patient's quality of life and that we each one of us bring something different to the table and each one of us does something different to the best of our ability and we're allowed to do those things here at UCLA. And I really thank you for coming to our webinar. Okay, so the first question is, if I have a tumor that's approximately two centimeters in a patient, what would be my first line of therapy? Well, that's a really good question, and that's a common presentation of a patient who has a two centimeter acoustic neuroma. I think it's individualized to that patient. I mentioned this before, that this is not McDonald's. This is not just come in, go, by the way, I love McDonald's. But it's not just come in, get your chicken nuggets, and go, and everyone gets the same chicken nuggets. Uh, it's remarkable that you can go to any McDonald's in the world, and well, I don't know the world, but in the States, and you can get chicken nuggets, and you know what it's going to taste like. But for patients, uh, it depends on that particular patient. What's the patient's job, first of all? Uh, what do they do? Are they in a job? Uh, I've treated a few patients who are musicians, uh, who uh, you know, their hearing is essentially incredibly important. So do they want to preserve their hearing in that ear? Is that hearing in that patient already gone? If the hearing's already gone, well, surgically, that, that puts translab on the table versus if the hearing is uh, intact, we want to try to preserve hearing. How old or how young is the patient? Have they had any exposure to radiation before? Do they have something like neurofibromatosis? And these lists of questions, each, each question down this algorithm makes everything more complicated. And ultimately, it's sitting down and talking to people and saying, are you okay with leaving this tumor alone? Or do you want something done? And every single person has a different threshold for how comfortable they are with that. And so I really do think that that comes down to an individualized, personalized conversation that you need to have. You need to have with your neurosurgeon, you need to have with your doctors, your radiation oncologists, and also you need to have with yourself, you need to have with your spouse, your brother, your sister, your loved ones, your family, so that you can come to a decision that you feel comfortable about, that you feel good about, and that when that consensus is reached, I think that's the best way to move forward in trying to aim to maximize your quality of life. Any other questions? The question uh, from the uh, internet was, uh, so for acoustic neuromas, how fast do acoustic neuromas grow? That's a fantastic question in terms of these tumors. Acoustic neuromas are typically very slow-growing, benign tumors. Uh, so if you had to ask me a given average tumor growth rate, some of these tumors don't grow uh, for a very long time. I have patients that we've followed for years and years and years, and we get MRIs once a year, and the tumor doesn't change in size. So there are tumors that don't grow. There are other tumors that can grow and grow uh, quite quickly or, or fast. And I think the ones that are most concerning for the ones that grow fast are cystic acoustic neuroma. So if you have an acoustic neuroma or schwannoma that has cyst-like component, a part of it that looks like it's full of fluid or like a water balloon, in my opinion, those are the ones that are most concerning for fast growth and also maybe less ideal candidates for radiation. Overall, I would say that these tumors grow probably on the order of one to two millimeters a year and that that's the typical slow growth rate of these acoustic neuromas. And so what we want to do is if they're asymptomatic, we want them to stop causing you problems, we're going to look at them with either observation or radiation. And if they're too large or if the growth rate is too fast, we would be treating them with open surgery. And when we look at the open surgery, we would look at either middle cranial fossa, translab, or retrosig based on the particular patient and whether or not their hearing is preserved.
the next question was, are there any natural treatments for acoustic neuromas? I'm taking that as, are there any non-surgical therapies uh, for acoustic neuromas or non-radiation? And like I said, the first thing to consider for an acoustic neuroma is if this is a slow-growing benign tumor and you're fairly certain it's not cancer, the first option would be to observe these, to watch them. And that's the most natural treatment I can think of. But then I'm thinking the question is asking, are there any natural treatments to the problems, which is ringing in the ears, um, ba balance issues, and to see if those uh, things kinds of help. Um, what I do know is that those symptoms can be exacerbated by stress. And so you always want to try to minimize the amount of stress in your life and, and in dealing with these symptoms uh, around, around them. Uh, sometimes different hearing aids can assist in terms of hearing loss and trying to uh, elevate the hearing in the contralateral ear or, uh, excuse me, in the, ipsilo in, in the ear. If there's any sort of hearing that we can try to preserve, uh, sometimes a, a, some sort of hearing aid can uh, uh, help with the tinnitus. And so what that hearing aid does is block out different sounds to help with ringing, but usually that's not a very good, good option. Uh, overall, uh, in terms of hearing uh, natural treatments for these acoustic aromas, uh, we're looking at things like um, uh, acupuncture, uh, massage, um, I, I think yoga, meditation, prayer are always good things. Uh, and I think all these things in total help reduce the amount of stress and how you deal with. Because I think having a brain tumor over, by itself is very stressful. And so I think having to deal with that is the most important thing. And then if, if you really want to treat this naturally, the most natural way to treat this is to watch it. And I think that's okay as long as it's not causing major problems, as long as the tumor is small and the tumor is not causing brainstem compression. I think observation is a fantastic option. We can watch it with MRIs and that way we can watch it and watch the growth rate and do an intervention before it gets too big, before the small problem, uh, before a small tumor causes big problems. The um, uh, next, treatment, next question is, what are the post effects of gamma knife uh, therapy? Uh, and that's a really good question about radio surgery. So um, gamma knife, excuse me. Gamma knife surgery is radio surgery. And gamma knife is a particular brand of radio surgery. So the way I think about it is radio surgery are like automobiles. And gamma knife is one brand of that. So it's like Toyota. Uh, and then CyberKnife is like another brand, that's like Honda. And so Gamma Knife is one particular brand of radio surgery. And the question was, what are the post-treatment effects of Gamma Knife radio surgery? Well, overall for radio surgery, there are very few side effects. Now for most Gamma Knife uh, surgery and Gamma Knife frames, they need to put in a Gamma Knife Lexel frame onto the patient's head. And this is done by screwing four screws into the patient's skull. And so this screw goes into your skull on this frame and holds this frame in place. And that can be not so pleasant because they need to put some numbing locations on those areas. And then you get the radio surgery. Some benefits of other forms of radio surgery, and we have a, a linear accelerator based radio surgery uh, here at UCLA. The benefit of that one is we don't have to use screws into your skull. They use a, a thermoplastic mask, essentially like a, a plastic mask that's fitted exactly to your face and they put this onto your face like a hockey mask and it holds your head steady. Both technologies essentially hold your head steady for the therapy, uh, but there are different ways of doing this. And, I, and when I think about gamma knife surgery, if you were uh, coming to me and asking me, what's the thing that's top of my mind gamma knife radio surgery? Well, the first thing, if I were to have it, I'd be thinking was, well, those four screws, I think they would hurt a little bit. Uh, and so that's the first thing to think about in terms of the immediate side effect. In terms of the long-term side effects, I think the radio surgery is about the same for whichever modality you, you use. A car is a car. Um, we want to look out for uh, post-radiation uh, radiation cystic expansion. I showed you the case where radio surgery doesn't always work. And so if the, radi if the tumor grows significantly uh, because there's a cyst or the tumor grows uh, sharply after radiation, sometimes that does happen. Uh, but otherwise, there are very few effects from radiation. Uh, the last thing that we want to be concerned about in radiation is We've known about this for 20 or 30 years, and so we know it's fairly safe for 20 or 30 years. We don't know the really long-term outcomes from radiation, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And so if you're in your mid-20s and you get treated with radiation, you know, we know that you'll be probably pretty okay for the first 20 or 30 years, but 
we don't know what's going to be like when you're 80 or 90. And so there's some concern about that. And with radiation-induced malignancies, we know that if you get radiation, you give a person that has no tumors and you give them a lot of radiation, they're going to develop tumors. And so that's a small concern. That risk is pretty low with radiosurgery and radiotherapy, but that risk is probably not zero. The next question is, can hearing come back after treatment? Uh, that depends, uh, and I think the an best answer I can give for that is sometimes. Uh, I think the best prognosis for hearing preservation is if your hearing is good before therapy, uh, that leads to a better outcome than if it was bad. And so we, what, we, what we do with these, these therapies is we're not so good at restoring therapy, we're good at making them, uh, stopping them from getting worse. So with our interventions, we're not that awesome at making things better, but we are okay at stopping things from getting worse. And so it depends on what kind of therapy that we do uh, in terms of making your, your hearing better. Uh, uh, after surgery, sometimes hearing can be a little bit worse, and I think that, that has a higher risk for uh, hearing loss. Radiation, though, also has a risk for hearing loss. And so because of that, we specifically, if your hearing is intact, and your hearing is okay. When we do our stereotactic radiation, we do stereotactic radiotherapy. So we do lots of fractions. Instead of radiosurgery in one dose, we do it in lots of doses here at UCLA because what we're trying to do is whatever hearing you have, we want to preserve it to the best that we can. Um, what is the typical age of acoustic neuroma patients or does it vary? Well, acoustic neuroma patients are actually typically older, so they're in their 40s or 50s, uh, but the age can vary. And I've seen patients as old as 80 to 90 uh, that have them. They commonly don't occur in children, or they, do, they commonly don't occur in very young patients. Uh, the, the median, I would say, is about somewhere between 30 and 50. Uh, but there are a few patients that I've treated that are, were in their 20s, and a few patients I, I have that are uh, upwards of 80 or 90, but the vast majority are in that middle middle age, uh, 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 age range for acoustic neuromas. Uh, there's a, a question that, that's coming in, and the statement is, I have been having uh, sharp pain and a lot of ringing. Uh, could this be an acoustic neuroma? Uh, that's a really good question, and it sounds like you're worried about this uh, symptom. So uh, it depends on where the sharp pain is. If you're having sharp pain on one side of your face and you're also having ringing on that same side, to me that's, that's concerning enough to get an MRI. Could this be an acoustic aroma? The, question is may, the answer is maybe. Uh, there's no, really no way to tell without an MRI. Uh, if you're concerned that you have an acoustic aroma, uh, the best way to get this treated or to get diagnosed would be to do an MRI with and without contrast. But the question is coming is, well, do I have an acoustic neuroma? Well, the most common way that acoustic neuromas present is unilateral hearing loss or ringing in the ear. So if, if you're losing hearing in one ear, and in just one ear, and on that same side, uh, you also have ringing in the ear, those are the two symptoms that, to me, at the very first onset, uh, say you need to be ruled out for an acoustic neuroma. So you'll see doctors, you'll see uh, probably a, a neurosurgeon or an ENT doctor, and they will do the workup, and it, it could be something else. There's a whole host of other factors, and the thing is everyone's hearing slowly gets worse as you get older, especially now in the, the era of the iPod and everyone having you know head speakers on. Everyone's hearing slowly gets worse as you get older, and there's lots of other reasons to get lose hearing in one ear. Uh, Meniere's disease, uh, vascular uh, reasons, but in my opinion, if you have unilateral hearing loss or ringing, I would work that up. I'd get an MRI to make sure that there's no other uh, uh, reason for that hearing uh, loss or, or, or ringing in the ear. Um, and so th th that's an important thing to look at. Um, what causes an acoustic neuroma? Um, that, that's a really good question. Uh, the acoustic neuroma is, is forms at the junction uh, between the uh, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. They, they occur uh, in, in that vestibular CP angle on those nerves uh, near the junction of the peripheral Schwann cells, and hence the vestibular schwannoma, and the oligodendrocytes that are um, 
on the peripheral nervous system. We don't know exactly what causes acoustic neuromas. If you had asked me, my, my best answer would be bad luck. We do know that there are gene mutations, and we are studying those in our lab right now, that if you have neurofibromatosis, we know that that affects a particular gene mutation that affects Merlin, and that that leads to acoustic neuroma. So there's probably some genetic component of this. But what causes the vast majority of acoustic neuromas? Some sort of uh, mutation probably that causes those cells to grow in, a, in an accelerated rate. And so the vast majority of acoustic neuromas are sporadic and random, and the subset of them are the neurofibromatosis ones, and those are the ones that are genetic, we know. But the other ones, we haven't identified uh, a ge known genetic mutation. We don't know exactly what, what caused them. There's some concern that radiation and, and cell phones uh, may be causing them, but there's no uh, hard and fast uh, literature that supports that, and there's no uh, scientific, uh, hard scientific evidence that suggests uh, that these cell phones may be causing uh, either meningiomas or schwannomas, uh, but there's always a small risk, and so uh, in, in my opinion, I always uh, recommend, recommend either a Bluetooth wi wireless headpiece or uh, a wired headpiece uh, because you can use that when you drive, it's safer, and just because uh, I'd rather be safe rather than sorry. Uh, the question is, uh, the, the, there's two questions that are similar. One is, can they be prevented? And are there things that can increase my risk for acoustic neuroma? Um, I would say, really the only thing that, can, uh, that we know that are, that's a really known hard prognosis uh, factor for acoustic neuromas is the neurofibromatosis. So you have neurofibromatosis, that's a known a genetic mutation that, that you're going to develop, that you have a very high chance for developing acoustic neuromas. But other, otherwise, there's really nothing that you can do to prevent these, um, and there's really uh, no symptom that I know that, uh, that causes these, uh, except that uh, there's some sort of um, uh, uh, mutation that uh, ha had them happen. Um, the next question is, are there any new studies on acoustic neuroma? Uh, that's a really good question uh, in terms of the therapies and, and how we're pushing the field. Uh, one of the really uh, interesting areas uh, is the molecular diagnosis and molecular profiling of acoustic neuromas. Uh, there are some studies and some patients uh, who are treating uh, acoustic neuromas with uh, Avastin or Bevacizumab, which is an anti-VEGF, anti-angiogenic factor. Uh, and this is really uh, unproven therapy, and we, we don't know exactly how this is going to work. Uh, one of the studies that we're doing here at UCLA right now is we're looking at acoustic neuromas and looking at their VEGF expression to see whether or not this uh, form of therapy has uh, any long-term implications for uh, treating acoustic neuromas. Another uh, clinical study that we're doing is looking at, like I mentioned, is the fractionation uh, 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 profile and the treatment paradigm for treating acoustic neuromas with radiation. Uh, do we want to use more fractions or less fractions? And is there some way, some ideal balance where we can treat patients with the right number of fractions to try to preserve hearing and also try to make their quality of life as best as that we can. And so and that's a study that we're, that we're doing right now um, uh, here at UCLA is looking at uh, stereotactic radiotherapy as well as looking at radio surgery to look at overall uh, acoustic neuroma outcomes. Uh, another question that just came in was, uh, can these acoustic neuromas turn into cancer? Uh, the, the answer is it's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. There are some uh, tumors in this area, uh, like acoustic neuromas, meningiomas, epidermoids. All tumors have some, probably have some very small rate in which they could turn into something more aggressive, but it's, it's fairly rare. Uh, these acoustic neuromas, uh, they turn more into a, a perpetual problem in your life is that they cause a hearing loss, they cause a ringing in the ear, and then through the therapies and treatments that we can do, uh, sometimes what happens is that they can cause facial palsy, uh, they can cause problems with balance, and ultimately cause hearing loss. And so what I think our aim, uh, especially here at UCLA and at the UCLA Acoustic Neuroma Center, is our aim for every patient is to maximize your quality of life. We want your hearing, we want you balanced, we want you smiling, we want to do customized, personalized therapy, whether it's surgery, radiation, observation, or some combination of the three, where that gives you the best chance at not having this tumor bother you. 
Uh, and so we want to do this. And so some tumors probably, uh, if given long enough time and if treated, um, if, if you make it angry enough, can probably turn into cancer, but it's very rare, uh, uh, very, very, very rare. And so that's, it's not the most pressing concern I have in treating acoustic neuromas. Uh, what can I do to prepare for surgery or radiation? Uh, that's, a, um, that's a question that came in. P uh, please keep the questions coming in. Um, I think we, we still have another 10 minutes or something like that, so the questions are great. Uh, what can I do to prepare for radiation or surgery? Uh, when I look at uh, preparing for surgery, at least, uh, I always tell my patients that you should prepare. It's like preparing for a marathon, uh, which... I've never run a marathon, so I don't know exactly what that is like. But the way I look at it is that this is going to be a very intense physical experience. Uh, this is going to be very physically draining. It's going to be a big thing. Now, you're not going to be aware of it because you're going to be asleep for the surgery if you're the patient. Um, but nonetheless, afterwards, your body knows it's been through a very grueling experience. And so, uh, in my opinion, uh, when you prepare for surgery, you should be getting your overall body, mind, and spirit as healthy as you can get it in, ready for, in preparations for surgery. So for me, at least, I recommend um, eating a healthy diet. Uh, you want to have a good uh, mix of proteins, a good mix of calcium, uh, fruits and vegetables. You want to change your diet so you can maximize your body so that after surgery, when every cell in your body is saying, we just went through something very traumatic, and we were asleep and we didn't realize it, but when you think about it, you had your skin open, you had holes drilled in your skull, it's, it's a very overall traumatic experience. You want to maximize your body so that you can heal from this experience. And so you want to get your diet changed. You want to get your body physically in shape. So if you um, are athletic or whatever, I would say do more of whatever it is that you do. If you do walking or running, I would say do a little bit more so that you get physically as well in shape as you can in order to prepare for the surgery. Uh, and lastly, I, I say reckon, get your mind and spirit ready for this is uh, understand that this is, 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 is major surgery and that this is a big time treatment for this and so you want to get your, your support staff ready. You want to get your family, your home, uh, your mind ready for this therapy and know that this is going to be a process that you have to go through uh, in order to get this uh, uh, treated. Radiation is a little bit different. Radiation, you come, get the radiation therapy, go home and have dinner. That's, that's, that's what's so fantastic about it. Uh, you can't have surgery and then go home and have dinner. Uh, but for radiation, you can come, get the therapy as an outpatient, and then go home. And so this is very appealing. And so if you had to look at quality of life in terms of the day one quality of life, it's probably something a little bit better. And if it's an option, it's something to, to consider. Now, again, for patients whose tumors are too big or if the patients are young, radiation may not be an option, but something to consider in terms of the fact that it is um, getting you ready for it. On the flip side, for radiation, uh, there's differing advice uh, on terms of how radiation works. Does it work by stimulating free radicals and oxidants and causing the tumor to stop? And if that's the way radiation works, for the brief time around radiation, you may want to reduce the amount of antioxidants and the good stuff that you eat because you want uh, oxidants. You don't want antioxidants. You want oxidants. And so there's no proven literature for this, uh, but it's something to think about if you're really thinking about uh, how you want to maximize your therapy for these different treatments is that as you prepare for radiation, uh, you want to think about, you know, max, uh, and you want to discuss this with your neurosurgeon or radiation oncologist, what's the best diet that you can have to aim to maximize uh, radiation. But essentially, you come and get the therapy, uh, you go home and have dinner, and so uh, it, it's not as grueling a process um, as the open surgery. Um, there's a question that said, uh, my doctor said that transtemporal suboccipital surgery might, might be for me, uh, would the trans lab approach be better? Um, and so uh, your doctor is talking about going underneath your temporal lobe, which is very similar to the middle cranial fossa approach. Excuse me. And your question is, would the trans lab approach be better? I don't know. It depends on your specific situation. Uh, the first thing is, uh, is your hearing lost in that ear? If your hearing is gone, then translab approach is much more appealing because uh, translab is going to obliterate hearing on that side. And so 
if hearing is already gone, then TransLab uh, may be a, a good approach. Middle cranial fossa is good for tumors that are small and very far out in the canal. So tumors that are very far lateral and that are small may be best approached uh, by middle cranial fossa. Middle cranial fossa gives you a fantastic approach of the petrous bone, and it gives you a, a, a super, superficial uh, approach from the top side. So what we do is we lift up the brain and we look at the petrous bone. And so if there are problems there, like superior semicircular canal dehiscence, and there's a hole there, we can see it and we can plug it. And if there are small acoustic neuromas, you can drill a small hole in the canal, find the tumor, and pluck it out. There are some issues that if the tumor is coming from the inferior vestibular nerve instead of the superior vestibular nerve, that may not be the best one for middle cranial fossa because you would have to go through the facial nerve to get the tumor out, and that might put your uh, facial nerve at higher risk. So it really depends on your own situation in terms of is your hearing intact, and whether or not TransLab is the uh, best approach for this. Uh, and, and we saw that there are different rates for uh, CSF leak in terms of TransLab and RetroSig, and I think these are all unique to each patient, and so it's very, very hard for me to answer that over a webinar, uh, but if you consult with your neurosurgeon or your radiation oncologist, uh, they should be able to answer that question. And it's really fair game for you to have a very open conversation with your neurosurgeon and say, look, this is all out on the internet. Anyone can look up Google now and look at all these uh, papers. All of this is on PubMed. I think it's very fair to, for you to say, look, these are the three options. I know I can observe, do radiation, or surgery. Why do you recommend what you recommend? Okay, we're going to do surgery. We're going to look at middle cranial fossa, transtemporal, translab, or retrosig. Why do you want to do the one that you do? Is that, is that the one that you're most comfortable in? Uh, is that the one that has the least risk? Is that the best approach? And would you mind if I ask someone else uh, if that is the best approach? Because I also think that with these small, slow-growing benign tumors, you have time to get a second, a third, or fourth opinion, and that no doctor should tell you you should not go get the second or third opinion. And if you go get the other opinion and it, it's the exact same advice, you go, aha, that makes me feel more confident. And it doesn't mean you're switching care. I just think... Uh, this is your brain. It's your skull. It's probably the only brain that you're going to have, the only skull you're going to have. And if you're going to make a huge treatment decision like this, I think it's absolutely valid for you to uh, look at different options and to do your research, read what's out there, study it, and become an expert on this, and then move forward with therapy. Uh, the next question is, uh, what's the largest acoustic neuroma you've ever seen? Um, I'd say the largest one I've ever seen is probably about six centimeters, uh, maybe a little, give or take just a little bit. Um, seen one up to seven centimeters, but uh, the, the largest ones that we've, we've seen are probably about six, five or six centimeters, uh, and those are actually fairly large. Uh, once you get past three centimeters, you're going to start causing a lot of brainstem compression. Uh, and in the past, these tumors would get so large, people would be diagnosed with hydrocephalus. Before MRIs, it, it was harder to diagnose these. Uh, but now uh, the tumors that we see um, uh, are, are, are commonly in that range. But that three centimeter number is very important because then you start having brainstem compression. And once you have that, we're talking about a whole different uh, host of uh, problems because your brainstem controls your awake status, your breathing status, uh, uh, your, the ability of fluid to drain out of your brain. So that's a really important size. The larger the tumor gets, the harder it is to treat it. That's just the truth. Whether or not we treat it with radiation or surgery, once the tumor starts going past two and a half or three centimeters, I'm more inclined to do something because now the tumors are, are, are getting fairly large. The bigger the tumor gets, the more challenging uh, the treatment gets, Why, whether we treat this with radiation or surgery, and that becomes much, much more difficult. Uh, conversely, though, there are very small acoustic neuromas that can cause problems. I have, I've seen patients who have very small acoustic neuromas, just a few millimeters, it's very far out in the uh, lateral canal, and they've lost all their hearing. And so uh, the, just because one is big or one is small doesn't mean you're going to lose hearing or facial nerve function. Uh, different tumor sizes can cause issues. Uh, in, in that patient that had a very small acoustic neuroma that was far in the canal and their hearing was already lost, uh, we elected for observation because their hearing was already gone. And so uh, there wasn't a whole lot that we could preserve, and the tumor was very small, and we had a first-time diagnosis, we wanted to see, well, is this a tumor that's going to grow quickly, or is this one of those tumors uh, that are going to just stay stable for years and years and years? And we have patients like that as well. 
Alrighty. Um, what is the quality of life like after treatment? And I am scared. Uh, uh, sh should you be scared of surgery? Um, surgery, uh, if we're talking about open microsurgery, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, a big ordeal in the fact that you have to have an incision. Uh, I try to, when I explain to, 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 to other, you know, young kids, I say, look, this is, a, this is almost like a stabbing. I mean, you're being stabbed with a knife, except you're doing, you're being stabbed with a purpose and a reason. So your skin is being cut. Uh, there's no way to get at this except to drill holes in your skull and remove a piece of the, the skull in order to get back there. Uh, or if you do a translab approach, where you drill down the petrous bone. So however this is treated with open microsurgery, uh, you're going to have an incision. You're going to have a scar. Uh, you're going to have bone drilling. And uh, I would imagine that those things hurt a little bit. And so we have not made surgery pain-free yet. Uh, radiation, radiosurgery, that's almost pain-free, but it's still, uh, there, there are ways to have, that you will have some pain. And so we give medications that help with the pain, narcotics that help with the pain, but those just take the edge off the pain. There's probably going to be some dull pain uh, related to uh, the open surgery. Uh, and then you'll probably be in the hospital uh, for a few days, and so that impacts your quality of life because this is time that's being taken away from your, your, other, your regular life, and then you have your recovery. And so it takes your time to get your bearings back, to come back from this and recover from this. Uh, and so these are the concerns that uh, you have to have. Um, I don't think you should be scared of surgery, though, uh, because uh, the surgery itself is well understood. Uh, and the more surgeries you do, the more comfortable you are with it. Uh, I think at UCLA, we have a multidisciplinary team, a team with a lot of experience. And so uh, it's not something that you should be afraid of. Uh, but I understand being nervous for surgery because it's a really big deal. Uh, but I'm willing to bet that your surgeons are not nervous uh, and that they are able to go in and treat this and deal with this in a very effective manner. Uh, and that's a really good thing about acoustic neuromas is that these are benign slow-growing tumors and the surgery is well-defined. Whether you go for middle cranial, translab, or retrosig, the neurosurgeons and the, and the ENT surgeons that treat these diseases, uh, they know and we know what we're doing with these surgeries. I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, uh, we'll do these. Uh, if, if I already had radiation treatment, is that, is that okay if, if I receive radiation uh, treatment for my acoustic neuroma? That's going to vary on your acoustic neuroma. There's a few places that are studying repeat radiation or repeat radiosurgery, but in general, that's not the recommended course of treatment because your body remembers radiation. So if you get radiation treatment once, your body will remember it essentially forever. And so there's a certain limit to which your body can receive this radiation. And so for the vast majority, uh, they treat these acoustic neuromas uh, with radiation. There are some areas and some, some studies looking at repeat radiation, uh, but it's generally not recommended unless all other therapies have failed. And again, each uh, person's uh, treatment is individualized. Um, and then, the um, well, I guess this uh, could be the last question. Um, is CyberKnife the same as GammaKnife? Um, it's not the same, but they're very similar. And so, uh, like I mentioned before, there's a umbrella term, and I would call this radiation. And if you do it in a lot of fractions, we call it radiotherapy. And if you do it in five fractions or less, we call it radiosurgery, exact same uh, radiation, stereotactic, but differing number of fractions, calls it radiosurgery or radiotherapy. And in that subgroup, there's a bunch of different um, branding names, McDonald's, Burger King, Carl's Jr. Obviously, I like fast food. And so different kinds of branding for different kinds of essentially overall fast food. Well, there are different kinds of branding for radio, radiosurgery, radiotherapy, and one of them is Gamma Knife. Uh, one of the oldest, uh, most well-studied is, is probably Gamma Knife. And then Cyber Knife is another kind of radiosurgery or radiotherapy. It's just a different brand name. They're very similar, though, uh, in my opinion. All righty. Thank you so much for uh, coming to our webinar. I really uh, enjoyed this experience. Uh, we'll be doing more of these uh, coming out through the years. And I think this is a wonderful experience for you to come to Ronald Reagan UCLA from the comfort of your office or your home and not have to deal with the hassles and the traffic and get information based on acoustic neuromas. We have a fantastic team here at UCLA with Dr. Martin, myself, 
Dr. Ishiyama, Dr. Gopin, Dr. Selch, Dr. Kaprelian, Dr. Baron. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, multidisciplinary acoustic neuroma program here at UCLA. And if you have any further questions, do not hesitate to give us a call here at UCLA. Email us, Facebook us, Twitter us. Uh, we're always available. Thank you.